Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose. Uh, I haven't done a presentation at RequireLX for five years now, almost. That was the last time. And so I'm a bit nervous, but uh, I hope that everything goes well. Uh, we're going to be doing some live coding. And this is something that I built from scratch in just a few days. So there's a high probability that something's going to break. OK? Uh, in case my MacBook fries up because this is too uh, graphics demanding, uh, I'll, I'll do something else, and we'll just talk about it rather than uh, live code. So uh, the topic I'm covering today is 3D graphics on the web. I made this shiny, shiny introduction just to showcase something that you can do with uh, 3JS and with React 3 Fiber in particular. And uh, this is what we're going to be discussing today. So I, I think we might all be acquainted with computer graphics. We've been doing computer graphics for the last almost 50 years. Uh, but back in the day, you would need to be a proper mathematician, engineer, uh, and you would need to think up a lot about uh, matrix multiplication and vectors and so on to achieve anything at all. Um, just in the last 30 years, and thanks to open graphic language, uh, so OpenGL standards, uh, we've been able to achieve graphics in a more manageable way. Uh, since the last, I believe it was almost 15 years ago, WebGL has been around. And WebGL uh, essentially brings the abstractions of OpenGL to the web. And it allows us to build 3D experiences on the web. Uh, so. I'm going to show you just how you would do something simple with WebGL. Uh, for me, WebGL is just uh, a tired old goblin. And this is why I chose uh, this goblin to represent WebGL. And I'll show you how we can achieve something as simple as creating a red cube just out of WebGL. So this is a lot of boilerplate code just to achieve something as simple as what we see on the right. So there's a lot of matrix multiplication going on here. Uh, here you have to think about vertices, uh, vert shaders, frac shaders. Um, you need to do all of the math by yourself. If I have to be honest, I don't 100% understand everything that's going on here. This is just the example copied from MDN. Uh, and so this is what you get with this much code. Then uh, a few years ago, thanks to someone called Mr. Doob, uh, 3JS was introduced. So 3JS is uh, a fun library that you can include in any of your projects that is going to abstract away a lot of the complexities of WebGL. So 3JS simply exposes a bunch of classes which you can instantiate and have something rendered on a canvas on a WebGL context. So if you wanted to achieve the same result as what we had before, but just with 3JS, this is how much code we would need. So here, as you can see, we've already cut down a bunch of boilerplate code. We've already simplified things a bit. Uh, this one I can explain to you. So what's going on is we are importing a bunch of the classes we need from uh, 3JS. We are instantiating a 3JS scene. So a scene is something that is going to contain our entire 3D world. We're instantiating a camera. Because if we're going to be rendering something, we need to tell the rendering engine how that something should be viewed and from what perspective. Then I'm positioning the camera at a certain point. I'm telling the camera to look at the center of the screen where the cube is. Then I'm instantiating a WebGL renderer, which is exported from 3. I am creating a simple geometry, so creating a box geometry. Instantiating a new material. This is a mesh basic material. It's a basic material because it has no reflections, no shadows. All it renders is a solid block of color. That color is red, so this is hexadecimal for red. Then we instantiate a cube. This is a new mesh. By combining the geometry and the material, we will look at uh, this just a, a little bit later. We add the cube to the scene. And then we call window request an emission frame, or simply request an emission frame, on a loop in order to 
have this animated. So we are simply changing the rotation of the cube. We are once again rendering the cube and we're doing this on a loop. And so this is the result with 3JS. Now, uh, I, I think a lot of people here are probably working with React. Can you give me a hand raise if you're working with React? Okay. Can you give me a hand raise if you've worked with 3JS or with React 3 Fiber in the past? Okay, so it, then this is good. Uh, most of the audience hasn't worked with 3JS yet, which means I get the opportunity to show you a lot of cool stuff. So then uh, React 3 Fiber showed up. So this was just a few years ago. Uh, what React 3 Fiber does is it abstracts all of the 3JS logic into a React uh, mindset. So what React 3 Fiber does is it depends as a pure dependency on 3JS and it creates a new renderer for React which instead of rendering simply HTML elements, as React does by default, allows you to render um, 3JS objects. And so what I'm going to show you right now is just a boilerplate 3JS or a React 3 Fiber solution to get a rotating cube on the screen. So as you can tell, we already have a little less code. And this code is React, as you can tell. So if you've worked with React, you probably recognize this. Uh, but you might not recognize some of the things that are going on in here. So uh, let's just discuss it. The first thing we have in React 3 Fiber is the canvas component, which is exported from React 3 Fiber. We can place the canvas anywhere within our React application. We can provide it with an optional camera property, which is going to tell it additional information about the camera. but. React 3 Fiber sets a camera by default uh, and uses pre and defaults for the camera, so this is totally optional. Inside of the canvas element, we are not allowed to render HTML. So if I were to attempt to render an H1 right here, I don't have auto-completion here, but it still works, we get H1 is not part of the three namespace. So what's going on here? I can still write HTML in any other part of my application. I'm just not allowed to write plain HTML within a React 3 Fiber canvas. So this is a limitation that we have here. Uh, but the, the gain we get is we get to render other things that we do not get to render elsewhere in the application. So for example, here I can render what usually are 3JS primitives within the React ecosystem. Uh, so here, instead of manually instantiating a new mesh, which uses a new geometry and a new basic material, I can simply use the composition capabilities provided by React to create a cube. Here, I created a standalone cube component just because I wanted to have it rotating. Uh, React 3 Fiber also offers us a bunch of useful utilities when you're building uh, 3D graphics, such as a use frame hook. So the use frame hook will simply run whatever callback you pass it uh, using request animation frame in the background. Here, what I'm doing is simply changing the rotation of this cube. We can reference this cube by creating a new ref here and calling use ref there. So I know that I'm typing this with any. It doesn't look pretty, but I just wanted to keep it simple for this example. So this is as easy as it gets. Uh, let me show you what you need to do to get started with React Tree Fiber. So it's as easy as installing a few dependencies. You don't need all of these dependencies. So adding 3JS, React Tree Fiber, and then optionally types slash three if you are using TypeScript is enough to get started. But if you want to build extra cool stuff, which we do, you can also consider adding React 3 Dre, which is a standalone library that provides a bunch of utilities that are built on top of React 3 Fiber, which are going to be very useful for us. And React 3 Rapier, which allows you to have a physics engine in your application we're going to be uh, using this one as well. So first things first, let's talk about meshes. So in a WebGL context, a mesh is simply a combination of a piece of geometry and a material. 
you cannot have anything in a 3D world unless it has a geometry and a material. So these are two requirements which we must have. Here, this is the simplest mesh we could possibly create. We have a cubic geometry, so we are instantiating here a box geometry. We could do it manually with 3JS by doing a new box geometry. We can also do it with React 3 Fiber by, let's see if this works, rendering a box geometry and passing it the arguments which we would norm normally pass to the box geometry constructor. These are the dimensions for this box. So if I want to have a larger box here, I can simply say I want it to have 10 by 10 by 10. This is way too large. Let's do 2 by 2 by 2. So these are values that you would usually pass to the box geometry constructor. The constructor. If you were using 3JS, you would instantiate a box geometry by doing something like this. But with React 3 Fiber, we can skip this. So we just get to do that. Then we are using a basic material here. We're setting its color to blue. The basic material is the most basic material that you can possibly use with 3JS or with React 3 Fiber. But as you'll see, we have some pretty, pretty cool materials that we can resort to. And so this is just the start. Then let's discuss geometries. So there are a bunch of primitives that 3JS gives us. We have boxes, spheres, cones, icosahedrons. Excuse me, that, that one's a, a bit hard to say. We have planes, and then we have cool things such as knots, torus knots, and uh, we can also use our own custom geometries, which can be imported from GLTF files. So what uh, types of geometries do we have? Again, these are just the same as, as the ones that I just showed you. And it's as simple as replacing a geometry by another geometry. This allows you to essentially build any primitive uh, mesh by combining a geometry and a material. So here you're seeing a different material. It's no longer the basic material that is provided by 3JS. It's a mesh normal material. This is an odd one. Let's look at materials then. So React 3 Fiber gives us a bunch of cool materials. These are the materials that are exported by default by 3JS. So all of these are available to us in React 3 Fiber. Unfortunately, in this screen, uh, we don't have enough contrast to see the distinction between, for example, the first material and the second material. So the basic material is simply rendering, excuse me, the basic material is simply rendering a solid block of color, while the Lambert material is rendering shadows, the Fong material is rendering shadows and highlights, the physical material uses uh, physical computations to accurately represent shadows and highlights. And so we have just a scale of uh, materials which go from uh, the, less, uh, the least um, representative of, of reality towards physical materials. So if you're building something that is just very simple, you can resort to basic materials as uh, what you're building needs to look closer to reality, you would go ahead and start using either Lambert materials or Fong materials. If you need to be absolutely physically accurate, then you would resort to physical materials. Uh, the reason why we wouldn't always go with physical materials is they're more costly in terms of performance, in terms of memory, and in terms of computing power. 3JS and React 3 Fiber also expose some materials which are not very useful by themselves, but which can be used for other purposes. So for example, the depth material uh, will be shaded from white to black depending on how distant the object or the mesh is from the camera, while the normal material always shows you the normal colors for each point in the mesh reflected back to you. This is a bit of an odd one, and it's a hard one to explain. But as you might notice, as I'm rotating around, you will always see the green colors in the upper 
half of the uh, object, of the mesh, while you'll always see the reddish colors in the lower half of the mesh. So by building on top of these, you can just uh, do other cool things, uh, which I will show you later in uh, some of the examples that are shared on the React 3 Fiber documentations. So uh, then we have custom shaders. So with React 3 Fiber and with 3.js, we can write our own shader logic in order to build something that is trippy or that looks different from what any of the materials provide you by default. We can also use something called matcaps. So if you've used uh, 3D software, Blender, uh, Maya, any of those, uh, we have something called matcaps, which are essentially materials which have been pre-rendered, which can then be used uh, for these purposes. And uh, you get essentially a performant material that can be physically accurate and uh, that can be more approximate to what you actually want to show on screen. Now, all of these materials, so Lambert, Fong, Physical, Standards, Tune and Matcap, Matcap, no, excuse me. So all of these except Matcap, they react to light. That means if there was no light in this example, none of these would show up. So I can show you that by taking out lights in this example. The basic material still shows up because it just renders a solid block of color. But if I attempt to render the Lambert material, I don't see that because it's not lit. N nor is the phone material, nor is the standard material, nor is the physical material. And here I need to write mesh physical material. So there are a bunch of materials which require lights in order to be rendered, which makes sense. So if you're in the physical world and you don't have any light, you cannot see anything. Since these are more physically accurate than just the basic material, they do require lights to work. So let's look at lights. 3.js and React 3 Fiber give us a bunch of light classes, which can be instantiated in 3.js or referred to in React 3 Fiber, uh, which allows us to lit materials in different ways. So by default, React 3 Fiber exports ambient lights, punt lights, spotlights, directional lights. Um, and I think those are the, the four which are exported by default. Um, by combining these, you can create just pretty much anything. So again, if I were to remove all of these, you would see nothing. But as I'm building up, so if then I have a single point light, I'm just illuminating all of these objects from one single direction. Uh, that direction depends on the position of that point light. Then by gradually adding other lights coming from other directions, I can gradually illuminate the materials. If you think about it, in the real world, we don't have one single light coming from one single source. Things are built up of multiple light sources. Plus, in the real world, things reflect light. Uh, here in 3.js or in WebGL in particular, you don't have light bouncing around. We don't have... Um, what's the word for it? So uh, games nowadays, ray trace. ray, I'll use ray tracing, or ray tracing is all the new rage. We don't have ray tracing by default in WebGL and in 3.js, which means light doesn't bounce around. So if we were in a real world environment, light would hit this cube on this side, which would reflect then on this side. So this side of the cube would look a bit green, this doesn't happen in WebGL by default. We don't have ray tracing out of the box. So you really need to play around with lights to achieve anything. Then let's go to cameras. So with React 3 Fiber and with 3.js, we can use two primitive cameras, uh, which are useful for us. We have a perspective camera and we have an orthographic camera. By default, 3.js or React 3 Fiber uses the perspective camera, but it can also be configured to use an orthographic camera. I don't know if you can tell the difference between these. So in the real world, we see using perspective. So your eye works as a perspective camera. Uh, but if you wanted to have just a flat projection of the world, of reality, you would use an orthographic camera for that. So perspective camera works as a point in space uh, which has a focus cone 
which can showcase that, while the orthographic camera works as if the camera was just a solid slate and you have a, a straightforward projection um, which is not affected by perspective as the one on the left. So how can we use cameras in React 3 Fiber? Oh no, did I do something wrong? So, oh wow, this is what I get for doing it live. Uh, so I think I might not be able to show you that one. Is it breaking? Okay. Okay, it's working. So by default, React 3 Fiber will render a perspective camera. If I were to take off all of that, we would simply see a perspective camera. We can essentially condition this camera or customize this camera by giving a camera property to the canvas element and assigning it a position. So you could set a position for the camera. Let's do 2, 2, 2. Since it's a perspective camera by default, you can also give it things such as fill the view. So FOV, we could set that to 50, which would give us a very different result from if we had set that to 100, for example. We can also customize near and far fostrums, uh, which is something that you would study if you're into photography, but it's a bit of a, a complex topic, so I'm not going to go into those two. And so by default, you can configure a perspective camera by just doing that. However, if you want to use an orthographic camera in a React 3 Fiber, and you want to have some additional configuration on it, you can import orthographic camera from React 3 Dre, which is the additional library which I encourage you to install or um, to depend on. And you could simply use orthographic camera to get an orthographic rendering of reality. So here we could set position. I could set it to 222. Then I should give this a make default attribute. And now I've got just a very small squares on the screen. It's almost impossible to see. So to be honest, I'm not sure what I did wrong here. Uh, I might have to assign it a zoom. OK, we're getting closer. Um, so you can essentially customize the camera you're using, either by passing a camera prop to the canvas or by rendering an orthographic camera component. Now for animations. How can we build animations using React 3 Fiber? So here, as you can tell, we have just this going back and forth. Now you might think, oh, we'll just use React's uh, state, for example, to animate this. So what if we just had uh, the position for this square in the state of a component, and then on a use frame hook, we will simply update this position, triggering a re-render of this component 60 times per second. This is a terrible idea. So you wouldn't want to start the position of a cube and set state 60 times per second, triggering a React update 60 times a second. Terrible idea. What we do instead is we pass a ref to a mesh or to a group or to any object which we might want to animate. And then within the use frame hook, we access that mesh by referring to ref.current and we make changes to that mesh. This means this moving cube component is getting rendered only once by React. So React is rendering this exactly one time. Uh, it instantiates a new 3JS mesh using a new 3JS block geometry and new 3JS mesh fong material. Uh, but that's it. So that's all it stores in memory. Then on every frame, so 60 times per second, it will simply tell 3JS to change the X position of the box or of the mesh by uh, setting X of position of mesh. We can also manipulate the color by doing something very similar. Here I'm instantiating a color outside of the use, uh, of the use frame hook because I don't want to instantiate a new color object every single time use frame runs. Uh, this is a bit expensive in terms of performance. So I would rather just instantiate it once and then compute a new color every single time and set that new color 
on every single frame. And this allows us to have very performant animations. So we could have a lot of these cubes on screen and things would still run uh, if, if you're doing things properly. If you were using set state here, for example, then a lot of things could go wrong. So here, uh, I have an example built with physics. So again, uh, we can install an NPM package called React3 Rapier that allows us to add physics to our uh, application. And it's as simple as wrapping a few components exported by React3 Rapier around any mesh that you want to render. So here we have an example. This one's a bit more confusing. Here we have three spheres and they're jumping back and forth. Um, what we have is a rigid body component which we can import from React3 Rapier here. Um, then we simply wrap these around any mesh. We render them inside of a physics component and that's it. Things will behave in a physically accurate way. Here the balls are jumping upwards because we can also manually manipulate the balls using the use frame hook, okay? So you can build very cool uh, physics experiments using React3 Rapier. They have uh, really cool examples on their documentation. So we're near the end. Uh, here, I'm just going to discuss instantiation. So if you want to render a lot of 3G, 3D meshes on the screen, um, I, I think the naive approach would be, okay, I'm just going to render this component 100 times. Here, I'm rendering this, I don't know if it's, if it's five by five, I guess you can do the math. Um, if I were to render all of these simply as uh, React components, this would get very expensive very quickly. If I were to increase this to 1,000 or 10,000, your computer would blow up essentially. So 3.js provides us with an instanced mesh utility, which allows us to render this exactly once and then replicate it uh, on the graphics card, and it's essentially a free uh, objects or free meshes being rendered on the screen. So I can show you the usage of this instance mesh class. Did I do something wrong? I think I did something wrong. Okay, there we go. By the way, I'm going to share the link to this later on, so you can come and check all of these examples uh, later on if you want to. And uh, what we do is as simple as using the instanced mesh primitive that is exported by 3JS. Uh, we render this mesh exactly once. So we have a box geometry being rendered once, a basic material being rendered once. And then through the magic of 3JS, this is going to be replicated, uh, I believe, 10,000 times here. Or, or is it, I think it might be 10,000 times or a thousand, something like that. So it's a thousand. But if I wanted to, I could make this 10,000. Uh, and it should still run. So let me make that 10,000. Let me see if my computer blows up. Um, OK, so uh, here things are breaking. But trust me, if you were to increase this to 10,000 objects, 10,000 cubes being rendered on screen, it would still work. So you can build super, super cool things using instance meshes. And so essentially this is it. By combining all of these primitives and all of this logic, you can build super cool 3D experiences. Here, I don't have one 3D experience which I have created to showcase to you uh, because it could take a lot of time to combine all of these primitives to create something very, very cool. But if you want to see some very cool experiments built using React 3 Fiber, I would encourage you to go to the React 3 Fiber documentation, go to examples, and just see the super cool stuff that people build using uh, something as simple as React 3 Fiber. Uh, so here you have, oh no, we're out of luck. Uh, so here you have, if you're a fan of cars, then you can do some super cool renderings with cars using React 3 Fibers and GLTF models. Uh, you can also do cool physics experiments using a Rapier. You can also build entire games. So you have entire games that are just built with React 3 Fiber, React 3 Rapier, and React 3 Dre. So this one, for example, 
again, not built by me, uh, built by the super cool people uh, behind React 3 Fiber. Uh, and you can go read the source code for this and see that it's less complex than it looks. <laughs> okay, that's a fun one. Um, so all of the source code is here. Trust me, I've uh, dissected this source code and it looks more complex than it is in the end. So uh, you'll be able to dissect this as well. So this is it. I'm a huge fan of React 3 Fiber. I really encourage everyone to give it a try. Even if you're not super into the 3D graphics world, uh, I think that it's a, a super, super cool thing. Um, and so I, I would really recommend that you give it a shot. Okay? So thank you, everyone. Do we have just a minute for questions? Does anyone have yeah, questions? One, one question. Okay. <laughs> I have one question. Yeah. Um, so I have visited Babylon JS in the past. Yeah. And they kind of have on their ecosystem like editors for um, some of the meshes or animation editor. Is that is FreeJS ecosystem also have those kind of tools? We don't have any of those yet. Okay. Uh, there's something called Theater JS, and people are hyping it up on Twitter, but it's still a closed beta. Uh, so there isn't one existing solution yet, but uh, there are multiple things popping up. There isn't like a one widely adopted solution though. All right, thank you.